This video is sponsored by LegalZoom. More on LegalZoom at the end of the video. Hey Wisecrack, just your friendly neighborhood Jared here. Confession, I've watched every single episode of the 1977 Spider-Man TV show more than once. Don't judge me. Okay, maybe your judgment is earned. No, it isn't. This shit is awesome. But in all seriousness, I really dig Spider-Man. And the thing that constantly draws me back, no matter how many times the franchise is rebooted, is just how American Spider-Man truly is. Last time you did the laundry, you turned everything blue and red. That was so a mistake. Know. Yeah. I was washing the, 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 the American flag. Now, I don't mean that Spidey loves pickup trucks and double cheeseburgers, but rather that he embodies fundamental elements of American ideology. Cap Captain? Big fan of Spider-Man. So cue that patriotic music and welcome to this amazingly American wisecrack edition on the philosophy of Spider-Man. Now, yes, many superheroes from Batman to Captain America embody different aspects of American values. Standing up for the little guy, fighting for what's right, adhering to a strict moral code. But Spider-Man does so in a way that uniquely reflects America's role in the world. Just look at Peter Parker, a young kid coming of age who suddenly gifted an insane amount of power. He's constantly wrestling with how to wield this power or well, if he even should. Parker mirrors America, a young country that post-World War II happened upon a massive amount of power and constantly grapples with how to responsibly wield this newfound power if it should at all. America doesn't have a long history to draw upon for moral direction, just as Peter doesn't have any parents to guide him. In fact, the only piece of advice Peter's ever given comes from Uncle Ben. You know the line. With great power comes great responsibility. Uncle Ben's famous words reflect many ideas inherent to American exceptionalism. You know, the idea that America is dope AF and thus has a duty to lead the world. This idea is encapsulated by the city upon a hill, a metaphor taken from the New Testament by American colonists to describe their mission, to be a beacon of hope to the rest of the world. Its use still continues. For example, The eyes of all people are truly upon us, and our governments must be as a city upon a hill, constructed and inhabited by men aware of their great trust and their great responsibilities. Or this Ronald Reagan speech. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. This view of America has been reflected in each Spider-Man film, from Tobey Maguire to Andrew Garfield to likely Tom Holland. In each adaptation, Peter struggles with the weight of his sudden powers, yet feels a moral responsibility to use them justly, a dilemma that mirrors two American philosophies, the reluctant sheriff and the American Jeremiah. The reluctant sheriff, first proposed by American diplomat Richard Haas, basically takes your standard grizzled Clint Eastwood cowboy and applies it to US global policy. The US doesn't want to enforce international order, but since there isn't anyone else as powerful, we gotta suck it up and govern the sh out of the rest of the world. Put simply, the US doesn't want to regulate global politics, but must do so to prevent the rising tide of violence. Similarly, Peter Parker, both the Maguire and Garfield versions, isn't even sure he wants to be Spider-Man, yet ultimately feels obligated. Much of the drama stems from Peter's struggle to balance his personal life with his duty as a superhero. In Spider-Man, Peter barely makes it to his Thanksgiving dinner because he's recovering from a fight with the Green Goblin. And in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Peter's late to his own high school graduation because he's gotta fight Paul Giamatti or something. According to Haas, the reluctant sheriff must also create a posse, people who work with the sheriff for the good of their town. Spider-Man works with New Yorkers to create his own kind of posse. In Spider-Man, New Yorkers throw debris off the Queensboro Bridge to distract the Green Goblin. In Spider-Man 2, the train commuters keep Spider-Man's identity a secret. We won't tell nobody. In The Amazing Spider-Man, all the New York City crane operators aid Spidey in web-slinging across town. And in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, the fire department helps Spider-Man to fight Electro. Even still, the weight of being Spider-Man is too much for Peter. In Spider-Man 2, Peter just flat out says he can no longer carry on being a superhero because it's ruining his personal life. I want a life of my own. And in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Peter makes a similar confession to Gwen. I know there's a million reasons why we shouldn't be together, but I'm tired of them. I'm tired with every single one of them. We've all got to make a choice. And here's where the American Jeremiah kicks in. According to thinkers Sackvin Berkovich and William Fispanos, the American Jeremiah emphasizes that it's the U.S.'s God-given mission to save this world. 
It's like the reluctant sheriff minus the reluctance. If we lose our focus for even half a second, or think that someone else might pick up the slack of spreading democracy, godliness, and morality, the world could literally end, which to a lesser extent is exactly what happens in each Spider-Man film. Take Uncle Ben's death. When Peter lets a thief get away, You could have taken that guy apart. I missed the part where that's my problem. His moral inaction leads to his uncle's demise, forever reminding Peter that if he doesn't live up to his ethical mission, people will die. Likewise, when Peter quits being Spider-Man, the bad guy power vacuum immediately fills in. In Spider-Man 2, during our hero's absence, the crime rate spikes and Doc Ock is able to rebuild his doomsday reactor. When Doc captures Mary Jane and the reactor becomes an existential threat to the city, Peter realizes he must be Spider-Man to save millions of lives. Even after Peter and MJ become official, they recognize that it's his duty to protect the city. Go get him, Tiger. Similarly, after Gwen's death forces Peter to quit in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, the Green Goblin builds up a network of supervillains, including the weird mech rhino Giamatti dude. The film ends with Peter realizing that without Spider-Man, the city is doomed to escalating violence. Even with this consistency between adaptations, some elements seem to shift in conjunction with American values. After all, the political climate surrounding each series were pretty different, so it's not surprising that there would be a shift in how heroics are displayed. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man largely uses what's known in international relations as hard power. He rushes into battle, relying on brute strength to stop his foes. There's no time for negotiation with the Green Goblin, Doc Ock, and the Sandman, just some good old-fashioned fisticuffs. Andrew Garfield, however, offers a soft power version of Spider-Man. He's constantly trying to persuade his enemies to stop their nonsense. I can see that you don't want to hurt anybody. This difference highlights a central contradiction within the discourse of American identity. Moral righteousness through strength versus moral righteousness through leadership. In the face of 9-11, moral absolutes were demanded with the Bush administration's with us or against us rhetoric. Obama's election, however, brought with it a youthful feel tied to messages of hope and change. As such, Garfield's Spider-Man uses more persuasive tactics to deal with foes. On behalf of the fine people in New York City and real rhinos everywhere, I ask you to put your mechanized paws in the air. So how will the newest iteration reflect the American values of today? Well, there's really no telling until we see Homecoming, but it seems that Tom Holland's Spider-Man may distance itself from the American Jeremiah or reluctant sheriff. Unlike the Maguire and Garfield films, Holland's Spider-Man is no longer the only hero on the block, but one of many. This shift reflects different models of how the global stage can and should operate. You see, in a unipolar world, there is one central power that keeps everybody in line. Many argue that our current world is exactly this, and the US is not only that central power, but it should be that central power, aka the American Jeremiah. But the world wasn't always unipolar, and some argue that it shouldn't be. In a multipolar world, there is no head honcho, but an assortment of nations with varying economic and military strengths who coalesce into alliances, sort of like, say, the Avengers. Holland Spider-Man, now just one of many superheroes, imagines this multipolar vision. He's no longer needed to be the beacon of hope and goodness because there's a dozen other superheroes who can pick up the slack. Heck, Spider-Man's even told by Stark to sit out the remainder of the Civil War fight. You're going home or I'll call Aunt May. You're done. Yeah, I'm done. In the trailers for Spider-Man Homecoming, Tony doubles down on this advice, telling Peter that he's in way over his head and that he should just stay in New York. Can't you just be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man? Aside from the political shift between Maguire Man and Garfield Man, there's also an economic shift reflected between the two series. The Maguire films constantly highlight Peter's working class status. Peter lives in a small house within a blue collar neighborhood that Aunt May struggles to pay off. His poor Uncle Ben has recently been fired. Go Corporation is downsizing the people and uh, upsizing their profits. And everyone in the family is looking for work. In Spider-Man 2, Peter fails as a pizza delivery boy, lives in a flop house with a shared bathroom, and makes a pittance from the Daily Bugle. Yet, the original trilogy valorizes Peter's poverty, endowing objects like Aunt May's modest wedding ring with a certain sentimental value that trumps any kind of monetary value. Hello. Peter's money problems are often used as a source of levity. I'm really sorry, Mr. Dickovich. You know, all I got is this 20 for the rest of the week. And... <sighs> sorry doesn't pay the rent. Playfully affirming the idea that struggling is just a step towards the American dream. Just look at the difference between Peter and Eddie Brock. 
Peter keeps his head down and just does the work, whereas antagonist Eddie uses flattery. I have this stupid little dream of working with one of the greatest newspaper editors of our time. And fake photos to get ahead. Of course, by the end of Spider-Man 3, Eddie gets unceremoniously fired and then, well, blown the hell up. The valorization of humble poverty becomes especially obvious at the end of Spider-Man 2, when Mary Jane rushes away from her marriage to a successful astronaut and chooses instead to be with the broke-as-a-joke Peter. This resonates with the early 2000s economy. While it wasn't terrific, there was arguably a semblance of hope. The idea of keeping your head down and working your way out of poverty was a bit more popular than it would be during and after the Great Recession. Yet by the time The Amazing Spider-Man came around in 2012, four years after the 2008 Great Recession, being poor lost much of its glamour. The housing crisis that Aunt May fictionally fights against in Spider-Man 2 becomes all too real for much of the US. As such, Peter's poverty is rarely spoken of in these films. His dad is now a rich scientist with a private jet, and his Uncle Ben and Aunt May have a pretty nice house. Instead, The Amazing Spider-Man highlights Peter's nerdy ingenuity. He's a science wizard, designing his own web shooters and assisting the genius Dr. Connors at Oscorp. This Peter doesn't have to grind away at Joe's Pizza. So what will Spider-Man Homecoming have in store for us? We've seen major political changes in the last year, and the economy seems to be doing pretty well, or at least the stock market is. Will Homecoming reflect this in its own unique way, or just offer us some good old fashioned mindless ass kicking? Will the younger Aunt May be characterized as a struggling single parent? Will the Daily Bugle look like BuzzFeed? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace. What's up, Wisecrack? Thanks for watching. With all this talk about great responsibility, you want to make sure that you get your legal matters done right. LegalZoom is the smart way to handle all your legal essentials, and LegalZoom is giving Wisecrack fans 15% off their purchase. Whether it's setting up a new business or planning family matters, they'll help you sling through the process like it's nothing. LegalZoom eliminates the need to rely on spidey senses alone to snag an attorney you trust or figure out how much your legal work will cost. And best of all, they get rid of those unnecessary trips to a lawyer's office. LegalZoom works with a network of independent attorneys to help you with all sorts of projects. The formation of your company, wills and trusts, trademarks and patents, contracts, and more. When we decided to do Wisecrack full-time, the most important step was making sure our business was set up right. Separating personal stuff from the company and navigating all the intricacies of state and local laws can be a huge pain, not to mention trying to figure out how to trademark our logo. But LegalZoom offers the services and resources to make sure you get it done right. So head over to LegalZoom.com slash Wisecrack at the link in the description below and bring all your business, copyright, trademark, and family planning questions. You'll get 15% off your purchase just for being a fan of what we do. Thanks a ton to LegalZoom for sponsoring this video. That's all for now, Wisecrack. Don't forget to subscribe and help us get to 2 million subscribers because I'm going to Fogo to Chow and I'm dreaming about that Parmesan pork. And ring that bell so you don't miss a thing. Peace, guys.